Hey guys, today I wanted to do a comparison of the Nikon 14-24 versus the Tamron 15-30. Um, these are both great astrophotography lenses, but if you're in the market to get one or the other, I wanted to show you exactly the difference between the two at night, just so you have a better idea of what you're going to get. To be honest, they both perform very well, and you'll be hard-pressed to see a difference. So with that being said, why don't we just look at some comparisons? Uh, Alright, so first we'll go into Lightroom, we're going to look at the raw files and I'll load these up. Nikon is on the left here, Tamron is on the right. The first thing I noticed, and really the only thing, is that the Nikon is a bit brighter, especially here in the center. And you know as we're shooting at night it's always critical to get as much light as possible and that really comes down to the transmission value of your lens or the t-stop. And if we go over to DxOMark, this is a great website if you haven't heard of it yet, but they test a lot of different lenses on different camera bodies, and the field we're interested in right now is called transmission. And we'll see here the Nikon gets three t-stops of light transmitted through it. So what that means is the lens, by the time the light gets through the back of the lens, you're losing about 0.2 stops of light compared to f2.8 and with the Tamron it's rated at 3.3 t-stops so we're actually losing a half stop of light from the time that the lens comes in and by the time the light exits the back of the lens which is a substantial amount um, we know that a full stop is half the amount of light uh, so that's something to keep in mind and we're actually losing a third stop of light compared to the, the Nikon with that being said it's not that big of a deal. You just increase the exposure a little bit in Adobe Camera Raw or Lightroom. But, you know, if you're paying all this money, especially for astrophotography, you want to get as much light through the lens as possible. Some other settings to look at are, uh, your scores rather, are sharpness and vignette. They're both rated for 19 megapixels. And since I have a 24 megapixel sensor, I am sacrificing a little bit of quality. But, again, these are both top-end lenses, and they're just not at that level. It's very hard from what I've seen for a wide-angle lens to get much higher than 24 megapixels. The other setting is vignette. We'll see here the Nikon is minus 1.6, the Tamron is minus 1.2 which is better, so the Tamron is less vignette. But both of these, the vignette's not too bad. If you compare that to something like the the Rokinon 14 millimeter, that's kind of the entry-level option, that one has something like minus 2.6 and that one is a really heavy vignette so these are both very uh, good performers compared to that lens. With that being said, why don't we look at the lens profile corrections and we'll see what kind of difference those make. Alright, here we have the before image and the after image. Uh, as we can see here, the after image, there's a lot more light coming in now that Adobe Camera Raw has removed that vignette and the image looks considerably brighter, looks a lot better. Uh, compare that with the Tamron. And with the Tamron it's much more subtle. Again there was less vignette to begin with and overall the image is still a bit darker. Uh, it's not as impressive of a difference here uh, with the lens correction. The next thing I wanted to look at was the color balance and this is something you might be surprised to see when you test out lenses is just how much different the colors look. Uh, keep in mind both lenses were shot on a manual white balance of 4800 Kelvin with a plus 8 purple tint so this isn't the white balance changing this is actually the lenses um, just rendering colors differently uh, so it's pretty surprising really to see how much more blue and purple the Nikon is the Tamron is much warmer by comparison, but again, if you're shooting in RAW at night, you can just easily adjust the white balance to whatever you want, and this isn't a big deal either way. One tip I will mention is if you want to get accurate night sky colors, it's they're not actually purple and blue, which you might think, there's so many Milky Way photos out there. Um, to get accurate night sky colors, you want to set the camera to daylight white balance, and that's going to produce more of an orangish yellow tint, even in a dark sky, and it's not from light pollution. That's just the colors of the stars are more orange and yellow and red, rather than blue and white. Uh, so bear that in mind. But 
ultimately you're the artist you can pick whatever night, night sky color you want just be aware of that uh, why don't we look at two more images and that should probably be enough sample images actually we'll do another one after this these images were taken much later in the night after I'd been shooting for a couple hours and I'm not even going to tell you which one is which because it's very hard to see and that's kind of the point is the, they perform virtually identical in most scenarios and that's really why I would say the Tamron is the winner here simply because it costs $700 less and you're getting the same performance as the Nikon now in this case this is the Nikon on the left again Tamron on the right if you look at the Milky Way uh, the Milky Way is a bit brighter on the Nikon because of the better transmission value and if you looked really close you could probably tell that there's a bit more vignette than the Tamron again minor differences they both perform very well and I'm sure you all want to know how does the coma or the astigmatism of the lens again this has already been cropped way in but really great performance here uh, there's a little bit of chromatic aberration on both stars or the stars in both images but nothing to worry about you'll notice they're not sharp though and that's on me I used a 20 second shutter speed which is not short enough to cancel out any kind of motion blur if you want pinpoint sharp stars at night you need to use the 200 rule which if you've heard of the 500 rule it's the same principle you take 200 divided by the focal length of your lens and if you're on a crop sensor you need to multiply your focal length by 1.5 so if I wanted to get pinpoint sharp stars instead of using a 20 second exposure I would needed to use about a 12 second exposure and that would have made a much darker image and for the little bit of motion I gained here I think it was worth the trade-off just to have less noise and more light um, but coma really isn't, con isn't a concern for either lens they both perform very well so hopefully that gave you a, a better understanding of both lenses really the only difference that I noticed again was the color balance was a little bit off on the Tamron I would say but not a big deal and the Tamron overall gets less light but again not not worth paying seven hundred dollars more I would say um, one other thing I want to mention is on my website I'll have a link to this in the description but I've got a, a written blog post that details what we've talked about today uh, the Tamron versus the Nikon and if you want to do some before and after images sample images here you can do that but there's also a link to I believe it's Matt Granger's um, comparison of the two you'll see it down here uh, but if you click on that link he tests the two during the day which I wasn't able to do but what he found was that the the Nikon does much worse with flare and moisture so he like sprayed the front elements of both lenses and the Tamron's beat it up better and overall when you're out shooting during the day what I found is that the Nikon is really bad with flares it almost seems regardless of where I'm pointing this, the lens at I'm getting a flare from somewhere and that manifests as some weird rainbow uh, pattern in my lens and it's really annoying to deal with um, so the Tamron does much better in that department with all that being said and as you can see here I would say that Tamron is definitely the winner you're gonna get vibration control better flare resistance which is big for me and you're gonna save seven hundred dollars for virtually the same performance at night as the Nikon um, you know the only real downside is that the Tamron gets a little bit less light and you're losing a millimeter on the wide end so if you're doing a lot of real estate photography that might really come in handy that extra millimeter when you're in those tight spaces but beyond that it's really not a big deal um, before I close out I just wanted to mention I've got a full Milky Way tutorial over on my website this covers pretty much everything you need to know from how to plan your Milky Way shoot how to find a dark sky what camera settings to use um, what lenses to look at which we've already looked at two today uh, what else what the different focal lengths look like so you can get an idea before you buy a lens what it's gonna look like in camera just a ton of really great info here um, it's all free over on my website also one of the big things I'm pushing in 2018 just because it's made a huge impact on me is looking into getting star trackers these devices essentially you would put your camera on this mount here 
attached to a ball head and it moves the camera around in a circle at the same speed as the stars so you can have sharp stars even over four or five minutes if not longer um, of course you have to blend two exposures together that's why I've got a free YouTube tutorial for that as well uh, a very powerful tool uh, for blending exposures there um, but this guide has pretty much everything you need to know so check that out that's peterslinka.com slash astrophotography and as always if you have a comment or a question let me know and the main takeaway today is that Tamron and Nikon are both great lenses but if you want to save some money go for the Tamron it's not going to disappoint and frankly um, it's going to probably do a better job during the day and I actually just remembered one last thing if you're still with me uh, I also did some reviews for 150 millimeter filter systems so regardless which lens you buy you're gonna need a new filter set if you like doing long exposures and if you're getting this lens you should totally look into doing long exposures you can get some really amazing waterfall shots or waves or anything you do but I've reviewed the ProGrade G150Z filter holder which will again work on both lenses it's a really great filter holder I've used this for the past six months while I was on the road and I always had it in my bag really great tool to use for long exposures uh, you can see some of the images I took uh, here we go with the 14 to 24 and the pro gray and I've also reviewed the Hada 150 millimeter system they also make a 150 millimeter holder that will work for both lenses I wasn't as thrilled with that one as I was with the pro gray the pro gray is a lot easier to use and you don't have to take your lens off but the Hada filters were really impressive um, the Hada filters have virtually no color cast and the polarizer works really well on a wide angle believe it or not I was able to take all the reflection off morning glory uh, pool there and when I'm doing waterfall photography it makes a huge difference so if you need some 150 millimeter filters definitely look into Hada and again I've got a review for them on my website here but check those out and uh, that's all I got for you today